this particular piece, the first Rhapsody of Debussy, is really a landmark piece that we can look to as a way to discover what expression, impressionist music is. Um, the, the French composers throughout the 19th century were pretty much slaves to German musical tradition. They were willing slaves. They were not bound to be slaves. They simply admired German music so much and the fact that its structure was so clean and clear a way to express a musical statement that, that they were willingly um, sucked into copying that kind of compositional model. Sonata form, for example, held sway throughout the last part of the 18th century and almost all of the 19th century as this principle that guided composers to be able to write coherent music. Pop music today is usually three and a half minutes per song and then structured usually in a very simple verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus kind of way. Sometimes the structure is a little more complicated than that, but for a three minute song you can have a simple structure. Sonata form, on the other hand, is slightly more complicated, not all that much, but the idea is that you don't just have a single idea, but two contrasting ideas as your first main statement. And then you take elements of each of those ideas and mix them up and play them off against each other in part of the movement called the development. And then you bring back the first couple of ideas in certain key relationships to each other. That's called the recapitulation of those ideas. And we are then able to create music, as often composers did in the 19th century, lasting 20 minutes, 25 minutes. In the case of Mahler, almost an hour of movement, of a movement, of a single musical thought bound together by this incredibly strong structural principle. And this was great, this was all well and good, but French culture being what it is, and even today we see evidence of this where French government is trying to regulate the use of non-French words in the language, uh, going against the cultural pull of the people, in fact. Uh, French culture wanted to maintain its own identity. We have our own spoken language, why shouldn't we have our own musical language? And so towards the end of the 19th century, composers started to look to the simplest poets who were able to create with colors that blended in and didn't clearly define things, kind of as un-German as you could imagine. And then they started experimenting in sound. How can we do that in music? How can we create an impression of an event rather than a bold statement of this is what is? Because when you listen to a piece of, say, Brahms, a great German composer, you pretty much know what he wants to tell you. This is what is. That's true. <laughs> so the impressionist painters and composers were interested in something much more, but I'm not sure what that is. It depends what light you see it in. It depends what angle you see it from. It depends what mood you're in at the moment as to how you can interpret this music. You're only supposed to have, and it's a great word, an impression of the music rather than how we say, this is what this music means. And I think that composers often create this idea with multiple layers of texture, just like a painter might. And so if you go to the Museum of Modern Art, for example, in New York City, and see right up close some of these great masterpieces by Monet and other great artists, you see that they're made up of many, many layers of paint, often very lightly applied on top of each other, with brush strokes going in different directions. And when you stand back from that, you realize that what was this mesh of color, or colors, emerges as a lily in a pond, glistening in the sunlight. It's the most fantastic experience. And composers, I think, like Debussy, are doing exactly the same thing, especially in the piece tonight. Well, that's true. It, it, this, the piece, interestingly, uses an enormous orchestra. It's not, it's played fairly frequently, but it's not played all that often because the forces are so large takes a lot of players to pull it off. But, I mean, it's about the size of a model orchestra, essentially, except that they almost never play together. They play only a few measures in the entire piece actually together. One of them is actually the last measure of the piece that I don't play. And it, it's, it's just kind of fascinating the way he just blends these colors and tries to give you, uh, as you say, an impression of something going on. I think the impression is of water. At the time he wrote the piece, he, he had just, he was, I think he had just finished Lemaire. So water was on his mind. 
And the piece is very liquid when you listen to it, and um, it's something that works reasonably well on the clarinet, and on a lot of the woodwind instruments for that matter. Um, and, and, and it's like he's telling a story. I, I don't know exactly what the story is. I have my idea of what it is. I it. do have my impression of it. But I don't know what he was thinking, and, and maybe he wasn't thinking of water at all. But the job, I think, for anybody who listens to it is to make up your own impression of what's going on. Debussy didn't tell us. It, it's your job to listen to it and, and let it take you where it will. And to give you another example of how Debussy uses this huge orchestra, one aspect of German music is the sumptuousness of the string sound, the core of the orchestra sound. And we have first violins, second violins, violas, cellos, and usually an orchestra the cellos are basses. So we usually have four separate parts. But there are times in the Debussy when those same players are what we call subdivided, and each given their own role, into 16 different parts. So what does that do? It's just like that one in painting that I was describing. It makes the texture of each voice much thinner, much more transparent, so that when you overlay all of these textures, you come up with something completely different, rather than everybody playing the same thing. Again, that's that Germanic idea of this is what is. You see, by thinning out the textures, by making multiple textures out of simple textures, he gets a, 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 a transparency to the sound, which is really, really quite marvelous. And so that, since we were talking about conducting earlier, you will notice when I conduct this piece, and I'm speaking to some of the young students here, that I don't use a baton on this piece. Because I feel that just by being a little bit gentler with my gestures and with the fingers, I'm able to further suggest the transparency of the sound. Now let's talk about your role too as a soloist, because if we go and contrast Debussy's piece with a concerto by Brahms, to say, the idea of a Germanic concerto is that the soloist is a protagonist, it is this the hero, if you will, of, of the event. And oftentimes there's dialogue between the soloist and the orchestra, but ultimately it is the soloist that stands alone against the, the world, as it were. This isn't all what's going to happen in this piece. It's vaguely the same in this piece. The, the soloist in this piece, except that you would have a hard time hearing it, might as well be sitting in the orchestra. It, there's a lot to play, and it is a solo part, but it relies entirely on the orchestra for context and meaning. You can take like a Brahms piano concerto and take a large, large section of the piano part and just play it. It's wonderful music without the orchestra. With this piece, the clarinet part is still interesting and it's pretty, but it, you don't know what it's talking about. And not that I'm going to tell you what it's talking about, that's your job. But it is talking about something, and the orchestra helps give it that context. So it's very different. I don't think I'm myself as the protagonist in this. I'm part of the, the whole color scheme. 